With every day that goes by, this programme of vaccination is creating a shield around the entire population, which means that we're now travelling on a one-way road to freedom, and we can begin safely to restart our lives and do it with confidence. And I want to be frank about exactly what that means and the trade-offs involved. The vaccines reduce the danger of COVID, they save lives, and they keep people out of hospital. But no vaccine against any disease has ever been 100% effective. So whenever we ease the lockdown, whether it's today or in six or nine months, we've got to be realistic and accept that there will be more infections, more hospitalizations, and therefore, sadly, more deaths, just as there are every year with flu. Even if we sustain the lockdown indefinitely, which would uh, itself cost lives and do immeasurable harm to our children, we would not be able to eradicate this disease. And that's why it's right gradually to replace the protection afforded by the lockdown with the protection of the vaccines. And our approach is to move with the utmost care and advancing in four steps, each with a minimum of five weeks apart, so we can properly judge the impact of each relaxation before we move on. And you can see the details of all of this on gov.uk. And we will be led at every stage by data, not dates, and we will apply for tests. The pace of the vaccination programme, the effectiveness of the vaccines, the pressure on the NHS, and the risks of any new variants of COVID. And therefore, as we look at the data today, I can confirm that two weeks from today, Monday the 8th of March, we will begin step one. And schools and colleges across England will reopen and teaching in classrooms can start again. All the evidence shows that schools are safe and the risk posed to children by COVID is vanishingly small. But to offer even greater reassurance, we're introducing twice weekly testing of secondary school and college pupils and asking them to wear face coverings for the rest of this term. Students on practical courses can return to university, but all others will need to continue learning online and will review the situation before the end of the Easter holidays. We will allow breakfast and after school clubs to restart and among other changes on March the 8th, you'll be able to have a coffee on a bench or a picnic in a park with one person outside your household. And because we know how stressful this time has been and how people yearn to see friends and family, if only fleetingly, we will now go further. And on the 29th of March, you can meet more of your friends and family outside, including in gardens, either as two households or subject to the rule of six. And then we'll go on to step two, which is no earlier than the 12th of April. And this is a big moment because shops will return and reopen, hairdressers, nail salons will reopen, pubs and restaurants will all be able to serve customers outside, precisely because we know that outside the risk of transmission is lower. And then five weeks after that, no earlier than May the 17th, we'll go to step three and open all our hospitality sector to service indoors, pubs, bars, restaurants, along with hotels and cinemas. And subject to capacity limits, we will also open sports stadia, concert halls and theatres. And finally, provided we continue to pass the four tests, then from the 21st of June, we will go to step four and say goodbye to most remaining restrictions. Resuming large scale events like business conferences and football matches, lifting the limits on weddings and reopening nightclubs. All of these steps will apply in England and the government will continue to do whatever it takes to protect jobs and livelihoods across our whole United Kingdom for the duration of the pandemic. And I know there are some who would like to accelerate the timetable. And I know, of course, there are others who would like to be more cautious and stay in the slow lane. And I understand both points of view, and I sympathize, because levels of infection 
are still high. And we must strike a very careful balance and always accept that we've got to be humble in the face of nature. But also, we must accept that we cannot persist indefinitely with restrictions that have separated families and loved ones for too long, threatened the livelihoods of millions, kept pupils out of school. It's thanks to the rollout of these vaccinations, many of them pioneered in this country, that the balance of that judgment is now changing in our favour. And thanks to the vaccinations, that there is light ahead, leading us to a spring and a summer, which I think will be seasons of hope, looking and feeling incomparably better for us all, and from which we will not go back. Thank you very much. I'm now going to ask Chris to do the slides. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, first slide, please. Um, this slide, uh, which is familiar, I think, to anyone who's watched the, these, uh, these press conferences, shows the number of people testing positive for COVID-19 in the UK. Uh, and as you can see, there are essentially two things to take away from this. The first of which is that the number testing positive has fallen and is continuing to fall. Uh, but the second is that the rates are still very high at uh, over 11,000 uh, cases on a seven-day average rolling basis. Next slide, please. Uh, similarly, when we look at number of people in hospital with COVID uh, in the UK, uh, again, you can see there is a significant fall that is continuing, but the rates are still high, and they're only slightly below the height of the first peak we had last year. So definitely things are heading in the right way, but remain uh, at a high level. Next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, if we look at the number of people who have sadly died with uh, following a positive test result for COVID-19, these are also falling. And the most recent seven day average is 480 deaths uh, a day. Uh, so still high, uh, uh, but falling uh, and falling uh, steadily at this point in time. Next slide, please. Now, all of the things we've seen so far largely are, are done or probably almost entirely are done due to the activities of the general public uh, in the UK and all four nations of the UK staying at home and following the lockdown guidelines. Uh, but we have had this really extraordinary uh, rollout of vaccination uh, across all four nations of the UK. Uh, and you can see uh, in this graph that this, this line is continuing to go up steadily, day on day. Next slide, please. So um, I just uh, wanted to uh, talk a little bit about what we would expect the impact of this to be. And the Prime Minister has also asked me to talk a bit about the results of three studies that were released today uh, from England and from Scotland. So the first thing in this slide uh, to say is that uh, the great majority uh, well over 90%, nearer 99% of those who sadly die of COVID are, are in the groups, the JCVI, Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation groups, uh, one to nine. And they're in the dark blue, and this is a study of people uh, in hospitals uh, in the UK. Uh, and the largest group of those, uh, 86%, are people who are in groups one to four. These are people uh, who are over the age of 70. Uh, and at this stage, uh, we have vaccinated the great majority of people in those groups, including in care uh, and nursing homes, uh, who wish to be vaccinated, uh, a very, very high proportion. So we anticipate that if the vaccines are effective, we would anticipate the death rate will now start to fall, not just because of people staying home and obeying the lockdown uh, guidance and instructions, which people are to an extraordinary uh, degree, uh, but also because of the effects of vaccination, because people have now had these vaccines. We're now on the middle bar, which is people in groups uh, ages 50 to 69, uh, already going very rapidly through those over the age of 65, uh, and people who have significant health problems who are under 65, uh, but who we want to accelerate the period by which they're vaccinated. So they too are being vaccinated early on. 
So this will lead to a significant further reduction uh, in the risks of people dying. And this also includes a uh, significant number of people who were then hospitalised who are not in the first four groups. But there are people who get severe disease and are hospitalised under uh, the age of 50. And it's important to understand that we must not leave them behind in vaccination uh, because that it, that there are still severe cases in people who otherwise have no other health problems, as well as people who've got uh, predictable health problems uh, in hospitals across the UK under the age of 50. Next slide, please. So my final slide is just to uh, make that point in a different way. And these are data looking at the proportion of people admitted to hospital with COVID-19 by age here in England. Uh, and what you can see is people over the age of 65, the great majority of whom have now been vaccinated, make up 58% of those people. But people under 65 make up a very substantial 42%. So there's a lot of people who would, if they got COVID, might go on to develop severe disease and go into hospital, uh, still unvaccinated. And we have quite a way to go in all four nations of the UK, but making very fast progress. Now, how effective are these vaccines? And that's a question which we said we think they're effective. Trials are very good to date. What we, was released today, both in England and in Scotland, were three studies which uh, tried to address this problem. And this is what the, the Prime Minister asked uh, me to try to uh, lay out. The first of them is a study done, it called the SIREN study, uh, that was done uh, in people who are healthcare workers, so young uh, adults under the age of 65. And what that showed is that uh, at 21 days, there was a 72% reduction uh, of the effectiveness of the, of the vaccine, uh, but the vaccine led to a 72% reduction uh, in the number of people who uh, developed an infection, even a mild infection, uh, at 21 days after just one dose of the vaccine. Uh, and this increased further to 86% if they had a second dose. So that's extremely good protection just from mild infection. Now, obviously, you have to have mild infection to go on to get severe disease. And then the second study, which is an important additional piece of information from Public Health England, uh, showed that uh, you got significant protection also in older people, including people over the age of 80. So over 55 or 55 percent uh, protection just from getting mild disease uh, at 35 days. But if people got an infection, there was a further reduction of around 50% in them having severe disease and therefore going to hospital. So if you put them together, you obviously won't get into hospital if you don't get disease at all, uh, and then you have a further 50% reduction. So we are confident from these data that the, the effectiveness of this vaccine in older people in reducing hospitalizations is greater than 75%. The exact number will change as the data comes in, but this, we are confident that this is going to be the case. And this is backed up by a third study that was released from Scotland. Uh, and uh, that looked at both the Pfizer vaccine, uh, which is the data I've shown from the UK so far, uh, and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And the headline numbers they report, and to be clear, I think these will change a bit over time, but the headlines that they report is that the uh, probability of, of the vaccines reducing your chance of going into hospital, so that's made up of reducing the risk of infection and then reducing the risk of severe disease, both of them together, uh, was 85% uh, for the Pfizer vaccine uh, and over 90% for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, and that, re that was remained, that, that vaccine effectiveness remained uh, in those who were 80 years old. So this tells us three things. The first one is, these vaccines, both the vaccines being used in the UK, provide a very substantial level of protection from the first dose. And in fact, the great majority of protection is from the first dose. So very important people get their vaccination. Secondly, the data suggests that that, that protection is, continues over a prolonged period beyond 21 days. So this is, uh, I think, supportive of, it doesn't prove it's exactly the right thing to do, but supportive of uh, our delaying the second dose. But importantly, the third thing it shows is that we must make sure that those who've had a first vaccine go on to get their second vaccine. Final thing the Prime Minister asked me to talk about was the delay of 
five weeks between the different stages uh, of this, uh, between the different stages as they're rolled out, the next phases uh, of the roadmap that the Prime Minister uh, announced to Parliament today. And the reason for that is that inevitably, for each one of these steps, we are taking a risk, which is an accepted risk. There, there is a risk to this. And everybody in the country, I'm sure, understands this. And what we want to do is, after each set of risks with a particular set of opening up, wait until we have data that tells us, has this done what we expected it to do? Have we actually ended up in a slightly worse place than we thought we would? Or have, indeed, we ended up in a slightly better place? But I think the, the big worry is, have things got slightly worse than we were expecting? And we cannot measure that in less than about four weeks because it takes that long for the effect to be seen and the data to come through and be analysed. 